what happened to political philosophy and uh, the theories of philosophy. A after Al-Farabi, however, some people like uh, uh, Hassan Ziai, the Professor Walbridge uh, work with him, um, they try to say that, yes, um, from Sohrabardi's philosophy, there are some philosophical, political ideas that some, some other, they try to uh, use those ideas. But generally, it is, you know, uh, we, 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 the question is that why not that explicit as al Farabis tried to do so? Uh, however, we, we have some <coughs> scholars uh, during in the course of Islamic history that they tried to write on Nasihatul Muluk, advising those kings and on how to do that thing, how to govern and things like that. But uh, still, no, uh, I mean, no such uh, per se philosoph uh, political philosophy. M maybe one of the reasons, I mean, we should think about it, but maybe one of the reasons was that because in the Islamic history there was the caliphate idea, at least among <coughs> the Sunnis, or there was the idea of imam among the, imam among the Shiites, and probably that so, and for Shiites, imam, the being of imam, imam was <coughs> the ideal type of governing, and so probably they thought that they don't need to philosophize about this. This is one possible answer to that question, but, but maybe the other answer is that most of this philosophy after Al-Farabi with Ibn Sina and others, <coughs> moved from uh, uh, natural philosophy into more metaphysical philosophy. So that's uh, being a reason that <coughs> some philosophers say that uh, uh, metaphysical um, talks and uh, <coughs> notions has nothing to do with, uh, you know, political philosophy and uh, philosophizing about the government. But <coughs> let's come uh, to the uh, kind of contemporary time and discuss <coughs> to uh, modern philosopher, again, among the Shiites and again inside the Shia seminary, the <coughs> uh, but both of them in Iran. First I start with uh, Alama Tabatabai. <coughs> Tabatabai is known for being uh, a philosopher. <coughs> he has written books on philosophy. He's famous. His books are uh, taught, and currently is being taught in uh, Iranian universities, in uh, Iranian seminaries, and even tra originally in Arabic language, translated, and taught in some other countries. <coughs> So also he, he was uh, he he's known as to be an exegesis to the uh, Islamic scripture Quran. Uh, his more than twenty volume of uh, commentary on Quran is famous because uh, it, especially in his method, first he being philosopher, his uh, uh, commentary of on Quran was uh, uh <coughs> sort of uh, if we can define it rational f interpretation but or what they call it uh, tafsir aqlani or uh, intellectual interpretation. But then he uses, in, in order to interpret Quran, he uses Quran to explain Quran. I mean, usually in the tradition, they use hadiths to explain Quran. Hadiths are those narr narratives of prophets and other imams. <coughs> but he tries to say that the text itself must explain itself. And then he goes to, like, uh, referencing uh, from for one uh, verse from another verse, and then he tries to make his uh, uh, commentary. Also, he was known for theology and other uh, usual subjects in uh, in the seminary, like fiqh, and as well in mysticism and Sufism. He has <coughs> important works on uh, Sufism that are translated into the other languages as well. <coughs> so, um, as well, we can talk about uh, Allama Tabatabai as one of the per, uh, one of the masters of uh, uh, f 
tradition of philosophy in, among the Muslims or among the Shiites, who was a continuous change, who was a peak in a continuous change, a chain of the philosophers. So it goes, he can, uh, I mean, his, his masters that, and the chain of the masters are clear from him back to time of Avicenna. Uh, mm, <coughs> so uh, as well, he was well known of uh, those of philosopher and thinker who thinks that there is a harmony bet between intellect and revelation despite the other group of positions that they think that there is absolutely no uh, harmony among, uh, between intellect, reason, and revelation. Uh, so it, it just uh, wanted to uh, let you know about uh, uh, Tabat Bayi. And uh, he also explains his mission as uh, when he tried to, because usually they were going to uh, from Iran to Iraq in, and the city of Negev. There was a, uh, there was a seminary in Negev, very famous for uh, Shia scholars. And then he went there, he studied there, he, he came back to Iran, he went to his home, Tabriz, and then uh, finally to Qom. And when he goes to Qom, he explains that when he reaches to Qom, he finds out that there is a lake of uh, intellectual sciences and knowledges in that seminary. And then he tries to establish a course on intellectual sciences or knowledges like philosophy or... Also, he, t he says that I, t I found out that uh, the interpretation of a scripture was seen as a low-level work. So, but he, uh, you know, um, spent a lot of good time to uh, write his uh, voluminous uh, interpretation of Quran. But uh, so going back to his philosophy, uh, to his uh, political philosophy, the point is that again about uh, about uh, uh, about the, po the question is whether he was a political philosopher. M many people may say that no, he wasn't because he didn't write an especially extra and a specified book on uh, political philosophy. He wrote about philosophy, he wrote about religion, he wrote about many other things, but not about utopia, for instance. So, but, uh, but in another way, we can say that in his different books, he talks, he is, he is giving his idea uh, society. He's giving his uh, ideas about uh, governance and things like that. One of the books, like for instance, Al Mizan, being uh, interpretation of the Revelation, uh, he uh, he talks about. And there are other some uh, treatises that he works and he talks about uh, political philosophy. But what I am t trying to say and to do here is that. I'm working, I'm talking about two Muslim Shiite philosophers whose talk on, on political philosophy is differing from what uh, Khomeini's Velayat al faqih was trying to present. So one of them is Allah Matabatwari. And I'm, let me say that what is Velayat al faqih is that the uh, uh, guardianship of jurisprudence. So it means that he being and have being a kind of uh, having the authority over other people, and the people have to obey him uh, because he is faqih and because he is knowledgeable in religion. So that's the general uh, definition of the law of faqih. But the idea is that what about these philosophers? What they what they have to say about the idea of Khomeini of the law of faqih, or however they didn't uh, uh, like uh, encounter him harshly, but they had another ideas. So uh, f f because he is a philosopher, he starts from philosophy, he, s he tries to say that uh, th there are some ideas in uh, uh, philosophy that uh, he calls them uh, realities and uh, c uh, contracts, contracts, or what in Arabic, haqa'iq and i'tibariyat. He means that, he tries to say that, hey, listen, Philosophy and uh, uh, governance is something which is created by people. 
how to do this. It is not a metaphysical discussion that we talk in, you know, because uh, Khomeini's ideas of Fulayat al faqih is kind of religious, metaphysical idea which comes from, the idea of Monk for, for, for uh, is, uh, is not like that. He says that governance is uh, an something that um, people should think about it because it's a matter of their uh, matter of their life and decision. And let me go back here. <coughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, th he has a like a chapter governance and leadership. However. He, uh, yes, in that, uh, he, uh, he argues, first of all, that it's necessary to have governance. And then, uh, and so he says that it's natural, that it's in the fitra or disposition of every human being, and they accept to have uh, a governance. And then, uh, the, the, then the question is that uh, who should uh, lead the society? Uh, then uh, the individual and uh, who excels others in administration, in you know science, knowledge, everything. But <clears throat> the point is that uh, whether this guy, whether this person must be a faqih <coughs> or not, that's the question. Uh, <coughs> um, so. Also in Al Mizan, let me grab the yeah the the, the exact wording of what he says. Uh, he uses Quran again to show that how the, 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 what's the Islamic idea about the, about the governance is. He says that in Quran you have terms that uh, calls people uh, uh, like aqimu belqist. He says that. Uh, establish justice. And then the, 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 the point is that the Quran doesn't talk to some specific person. It's a, it gives, a, a, it talks to all people. Do this. If you want to make a governance, make a, establish justice. So it is a, it's a duty upon all people. So, and then he goes again to say, Taslit al kulla al kul. So, again, what is this established justice? He says that this is the authority of all to all. So, so everyone has a share in the power. And it, again, there are some other uh, Quran verses he referred to, Al Mu'minun Ba'z Hum Audi Al Ba'z. And uh, so, yeah. And so, <laughs> so the idea is that, uh, yeah, he, he tries to, to make it not uh, a person, as faqih, but he tries to interpret it as all to all. And then it defines as how all to all. It goes to ideas like democracy, ideas like, and uh, I don't go, I'm not going to discuss those things. Mm. Sure, uh, he has, uh, 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 I don't have time to talk about what the similarities and differences he has with Al-Farabi. Uh, uh, but, yeah, so the, the, the idea is he was, uh, he was using philosophy as basement of the idea of making governance, and then uh, he was trying to, as well, introduce another idea, uh, which was al taslit al kull ala al kull in Arabic, which means that the authority of all to all. And then he goes to discuss in in, in, in detail about how does it works. And he also brings, uh, you know, evidence from the um, Islamic scripture. The other person I'm talking about uh, is uh, Mahdi Ha'iri Yazdi. Uh, the importance of this person is that. He was the son of the Abdul Karim Ha'iri Yazdi, the person who established the very important and famous seminary of Qom. So he's the son. His father, his father was master of Khomeini and many other ulema of contemporary Iran as well. But he himself was a student of Khomeini at, this, at, uh, at his young hood. 
he studied philosophy with him. But he went after a while, he also went to Tehran University. He got his PhD in philosophy there. He went to Canada. He got his PhD in Western philosophy as well. So he was well versed in Islamic and Western philosophy. Um, <coughs> He's, I mean, he was one of the Khomeini's students, and uh, f after Islamic Revolution, very early at that stage, Khomeini taught, he was living in the U.S., and Khomeini said that, okay, uh, Mehdi Hayri Yazdi should be our ambassador in the U.S. And uh, he says that in his memoirs that I went to embassy, and there was people coming and going out, and and in one or after one or two days, he's write a resignation to Khomeini, says that, hey, I can't do this job <laughs> until he goes back to his university. So, um, as, as, as I said, he well versed and trained in those uh, sciences, but uh, the idea is that, again, when he is, uh, he is contemporary with Khomeini and his reliant on Fakir ideas, and then he, he writes a book uh, on, on governance, as Hikmat wa Hukumat, so the philosophy and governance, that's the translation of the book. And he mentions the state-society relation belong ex exclusively to aql amali Because uh, in philosophy, they divide the, the, um, the practical uh, uh, reasoning and, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> so so uh, he, he, he says that, hey, listen, uh, uh, governance is a part of philosophical discussion and not a part of religious discussion. It's not. He says that it must be discussed under practical reasoning, which is part of philosophy. And as well, when you talk about this, it's not a metaph metaphysic, it's a, a human thing. And uh, Islamic political theory cannot be developed simply on a reliance on jurisprudence. Rather, a robust political thought must be strongly rooted on philosophy. When conflict arises in political affairs between Islamic practical philosophy on one hand and Shiite jurisprudence on the other, one should side with practical philosophy. He rejects the concept of guardianship of jurists, arguing that the government, government, government is not a superior divine metaphysical reality in the way the theory of light of faith is. And then he says that uh, the representative is a vakil, not a vakil is a, is a representative. He, he uses the idea that the governance uh, is the, uh, a joint private ownership or maliki, yet a shakhsi mushal. All people are sharing this, and the, the one who is governing them is the vakil. So people can go and uh, let him to be in power for some certain time, and if they don't like him, and they don't approve him, they can ask him not to be in that position. So, uh, um, sorry, I didn't believe that I may run out of time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'm sorry for doing that. Oh, we have a few minutes for questions to either or both of the panelists. Um, so, the floor is open. And yeah, so your hand first. I'm curious about um, looking at the concept of reliable faculty within um, Tabo Tabo is framework. Yeah. If Tabataba is still alive, like, or Mirza still alive, like, how do you see the concept of reliability? Like, personally, Khomeini, Tabataba has connection, and yeah. also, like, yeah. Mirza. Yeah. So how do you see the reliability within Tabataba is? Uh, um, I sort of uh, strongly believe that uh, <laughs> Tabataba uh, in philosophy and in mysticism had many things in common with Khomeini, but in philo political philosophy, he wasn't. He was disagreeing with him. And the, the other reason is that he, he, he was a very marginal participant in this Iranian Islamic revolution. He sort of didn't participate. He just signed two or three letters um, with the other people you know, in support of freedom and things like that. But he was uh, marginal. He was not. Uh, 
uh, I uh, I have um, um, heard from people that he was not thinking that revolution is going going to help people. That's the idea that he had. I mean, in, in practice, but in theory as as well that he's uh, not supporting the idea of philosophy. Thank you. Thanks for what you presented. Me? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, you're next, though. Thank you for uh, interesting talk. We on, uh, I was wondering if at short traveled around besides Iran, did you go to Ottoman territories, to the Caucasus? Uh, I mean, he read in Ottoman Turkish. Did he know Turkish? Where did he learn that? Does he belong to the Afshar tribe family? And also, I wonder if he was in touch or was reading newspapers coming from the Caucasus. Because Hassan Zahrabi was at the forefront of education. He wrote quite a lot. I wonder if there was any communication between two. Did they learn from each other? If not, I would recommend that to look at Hassan Zahrabi. He has written quite a lot about these issues in Islamic world education. Thank you. Well, he, if we accept the family narrative, he was quite disconnected from his original family because uh, I didn't have time to mention, but uh, the family narrative goes that his father took him to England and entrusted him with the family there and was brought up by a uh, British family. For, for this, I don't have yet any evidence. Uh, but he, he seems to be disconnected from the original family, and that's why he's looking for them in the uh, Kerman Shah area. So he was not really affiliated with that tribe, and maybe that's why he finally settles in Esauan, a place that you know, has nothing to do with the, uh, his original Afshar tribe. As far as Turkish, uh, so far I think that uh, both uh, Ottoman Turkish and uh, uh, Armenian that he knew was the result of him living uh, for at least some 10 years in, uh, in Ottoman Empire. Uh, places that he have been, as I mentioned, is Levant area in northern Iraq. That's uh, so far uh, I've seen. His son, his first son, Muhammad, also knew all of these languages. So he was a teenager when he was in these areas and his first visit to Iran, to Kermanshah. So, yeah, and thank you for your um, recommendations. Yes, thanks. On uh, the 70s, Khomeini also was an exile in Najaf. I just wondered if there was any collaboration between Alameda Tabai and Khomeini, why for same time they were living in Najaf? Uh, yes, Alameda before Khomeini, I mean before Khomeini came back to Iran, first he went to Tabriz, and then after some ten years he came back to Qom. So they were not at the same time. Yes, but uh, as I said, that he just signed one or two letters in support of. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you a question. Tell me about your family connection to this gentleman. Oh, so uh, this person is the uh, grandfather of my great grandmother. And there was always a uh, story about him uh, that we heard from my great grandmother. She, she lived a long life. So um, my father interviewed her first time in, uh, it is recorded in the 80s when she is in her uh, early 70s. And then later uh, when I was, uh, when my sister and I were you know, towards our late teenage years, we interviewed her again and we recorded the whole story. The both narratives, by the way, are uh, completely compatible. At this time she was in her uh, early 90s, a few years before uh, she passed away. Um, so yeah, uh, it was kind of a family discovery for me too that uh, I have some ancestors that uh, converted into Baha'ism, the very first generation of Baha'is, which was something that I had no idea. I had a question. Thank you for your talk, both of you. I found it very interesting to learn that in the 1880s, uh, Iran had a very moderate view of uh, Baha'i advocates and that that changed at the end uh, of, that, of that period of time. What, were the, what was the reason for the change? Was it purely a political thing? Was there, are there economic factors involved? This is kind of outside your talk. I, I recognize that, but, but it was interesting to learn that you know, the Iranians' acceptance of Baha'i as a 
kind of a branch off of Islam has kind of ebbed and flowed over the years. So uh, are you specific, uh, specifically asking about like demand for modernization in, in, in Baha'i community of Iran or like generally in the Iranian society? Well, I, I guess in general, Iranian society, what, why, what led to the very harsh treatment of Baha'i advocates? Uh, well, it exists from the very beginning, even before the uh, emergence of Baha'ism, uh, when Shaykhis are around and then uh, Babis from which uh, Baha'i faith comes out. Uh, well, both faiths, they touch a very sensitive issue in, uh, in uh, Shiism. And that's uh, Shiites uh, are waiting for a messiah, and Bob uh, claimed to be that messiah. So, uh, from the Shiite point of view, um, uh, most of the ulama sees they see Baha'is as some sort of uh, apostate or, you know, uh, out of religion. So the the prosecution uh, happened on on that uh, on those grounds, uh, and it's. Uh, you know, it, it continued uh, in the, as far as I have seen in the contemporary Iranian history. Uh, as for the demand for modernization in 19th century, I don't think it stopped. It, uh, so there are two parallel forces. Uh, usually, uh, you know, on the part of ulama, many of them, they, uh, they're more conservative. They uh, resist uh, modernization. But people who were asking for modernization uh, continued, and a uh, you know, few years uh, after this, uh, Iranian constitutional revolution happened, and uh, it is the first constitution in the, if I'm not mistaken, in the, in the region, and the fa first parliament. So this is, uh, the, the two traditions, they persist side by side, and they are always uh, in conflict. All right, it's one o'clock. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers and thank the uh, Center for the Study of the Middle East for their uh, hospitality and their lunch. And uh, thank you for coming again.